In the depths of the Scottish winter, we only have about seven hours of daylight. And even during the day, the weather is often something you don't really want to go out in. Nowadays, with electricity, the ability to light our homes is something we forget to appreciate. We might think candles and paraffin lamps are old school, but these only came common in the late 19th century. So before this time, how did people see anything inside their homes? Back when the average house didn't even have any windows. Well, in this video, I'm going to look at three common lighting methods that have been around since the Stone Age all the way to the early 20th century. So, stay tuned. Hi folks, Tom from Van Dozy. Thanks for tuning in. So, I like making videos about a bunch of different topics, but mainly around the topic of wilderness living skills, often from a historical perspective. And I have a whole series of videos looking at the wider story of the 17th century Highlander and how they used the land to meet their basic needs. And what I love so much about this topic of wilderness survival skills is it forces you to simplify life to its absolute basics, giving you strong foundations from which you can build everything else in life from. Now the ability to see what we're doing is perhaps so basic we forget to appreciate it. And if you read any modern book on bushcraft and survival, it will tell you how a flashlight or head torch is an essential piece of kit in order to keep you safe in the outdoors. Now of course, these are very recent inventions and for most of human history, people have had to burn something in a controlled way in order to cast light. Now sure, if you have a pre-bought candle or oil lamp good to go, then this is quite easy. But if you have to make the fuel, the wick, and sometimes the lamp, then this takes quite a lot of prior preparation and attention just to have consistent light. And as I'll show you, the average poor person of the past was generally responsible for all of these steps just to keep their house illuminated. So if you're interested in any of the topics I cover, then why don't you check out my playlists? I've got one on survival trips, Highlander survival, archery, martial arts, philosophy, and much more. If that doesn't satisfy you, then head over to my Patreon page, donate whatever you can afford, and there you get access to a reading list for this video, as well as my past videos, as well as monthly behind the scenes content. If that still doesn't tickle your learning taste buds, then click that link below and try a free trial with Wandrium, and there you find a bunch of related in-depth online courses. Now I know these mid-roll ads are quite annoying, but honestly folks, if it wasn't for the support of my patrons and sponsors like Wandrium, I simply couldn't afford to spend as much time making these videos. And it's a pretty cool platform if you enjoy learning about pretty much anything you can think of. So clicking that link below really does help folks. If you're like me and are relentlessly curious about everything, then Wandrium is like the biggest online candy shop of well-researched knowledge on the internet. Wandrium is the rebrand of The Great Courses Plus, and it's basically the Netflix of learning, but now with even more courses to choose from. On one subscription, you get access to thousands of courses on pretty much any subject you can think of, from science, music, history, philosophy, relationship advice, building a business, you name it, they've got it. There's no homework or tests, you just learn whatever you want, whenever you want. Subjects are given by experts in their field from Ivy League universities or organisations like National Geographic and content is updated monthly. Favourite thing about it is you can download the audio of the lectures onto your phone so you can listen to it whenever you want. I also like the university style of lectures as it gives you a great academic background, a non-biased viewpoint and context for every subject. The new year is a perfect time to invest in yourself and what better way to do that than having Wandrium's extensive library in your pocket wherever you go. Did you know light can act like a particle or a wave depending on whether it's being observed or not? I learned this mind-blowing fact, as well as many others on the course, the evidence for modern physics. How we know what we know. Some past courses I've enjoyed include The Celtic World, Surviving Any Disaster, and Cooking Across the Ages, as well as Real Zen for Real Life. You can try it out for free by going to wandrium.com forward slash fandabidozy or click the link in the description below. Now for this video, I'm mainly going to be looking at lighting from the context of within the home or base camp, but some of these methods could be improvised when you're out in the wild. Now for the sake of this video, I'm just going to focus on three types of illumination technology that were common in the Scottish Highlands during the 17th century, but some methods go as far back as the Stone Age. And I'll refer to these as fur candles, rush lights, and a unique oil lamp design known as a Coley, Cruzy, or Cruishin, 
in Gaelic. So let's first imagine what it was like living in the typical Highlander's house of the 17th century, with walls made of stone and or turf, a roof of thick thatch, a small door, and often no windows, or if there was windows, they were very small. In the centre of the house was the fire. Above the fire would hang the cooking pot, often suspended from the main roof beam using a chain. Now sometimes a house had a chimney, but often not, and the smoke was simply left to find its way through the thatch. This fire in the centre of the house would be burning almost constantly, providing a source of light in itself. But you can deliberately feed this fire with different fuels to give off more light. A common way was by feeding the fire wood from conifer trees containing high concentrations of resin. Simply put, within the resin of conifer trees, such as pine, spruce, larch or fir, contains within it a substance known as turpentine, which is very flammable and is also a preservative. So imagine a living conifer tree has its resin moving freely through it, but when that tree dies, the resin slowly flows down the tree with gravity, typically collecting in the joints where the branches meet the trunk, and also at the base of the trunk. As this resin is a preservative, it can sit there for many years as the rest of the resinless tree decomposes. So you can come along and break off the decaying wood and get to the amber coloured resin soaked wood. This is often referred to as resin wood or fat wood and is still used today in bushcraft as a method of lighting fires using a ferro rod. So people would feed their fires with this resin wood to produce lots of flames and light, but a more controlled and resourceful way of using this fuel is by splitting it into thin splinters before lighting it. And here we have our first method of illumination, generally referred to in the history books as fir candles, fir just being a very general name for conifer trees. So in certain times of the year, people would go out to the pine forest and harvest large quantities of this resin wood and just keep it in the house and splinter it into candles as and when they needed it. Now these fir candles were either held in specialized little holders designed for the job or they were stuck inside the links of a cooking chain in order to cast light over the cooking area. There's even stories of old ladies or children whose entire job it was in the evening was just to sit there and hold the candles to provide light to whoever else needed it in the household. So how effective are these fur candles? Well, the size of the splinter and the angle at which you pitch it determines how fast they burn. I experimented with this piece, which is 11 centimeters long and about a centimeter wide, and it only burned for about six minutes effectively, and I had to keep adjusting it to stop the flame from getting too big. Therefore, lighting your house using this method would take constant attention. It also spits quite a lot and produces a thick, black, pine-smelling smoke. So according to the historical literature, this method of lighting was most common in the central highlands, where it was harder to get access to fish oil, which, as I'll show you, was the main fuel for the cruisy lamp. And this is illustrated beautifully in an old Gaelic poem originating from Glen Morriston, which is in the central highlands, and it goes... Gliana mean modestin, farnach ich na con na canulin. This translates as Fair Glen Morriston, where the dogs don't eat the candles. <laughs> so, the fur candle is inedible compared to fuels that people were using in other parts of the Highlands, where animal fat or oil. So, you can imagine with those candles, you need to make sure you keep them out of reach from the dogs, otherwise, the dogs would eat your candles. So that brings me to my second method of illumination. For this method, we need to look at this common Scottish plant known as soft rush, which I've talked about in a previous video. The Gaelic name for this is luacher, and the entomology of the word is related to the Latin lux, which means light. 
giving away what it was used for. A typical job for the Highland children was to go out and harvest the rush by cutting it close to the base. They would then peel off the outer green skin, exposing the white inner pith. This pith is made of hundreds of tiny tubes which help the plant draw up water from the ground. These capillaries also mean it works as an excellent wick. After gathering the soft rush pits, they were left to dry. Now say you've just finished cooking some sort of animal, whether beef, mutton or pork, and you have some melted fat left over. Grab your soft rush pith, chuck it in and let it soak up the fat. Take it out and let the fat cool and harden. You can then get your hardened fat soaked pith, you can put it in the same holder used for the fur candles, light it up, and there we have our second method of illumination, typically referred to as a rush light. Now you could use something like beeswax for the fuel, but this doesn't seem to be as common as maybe beeswax was too valuable and useful to be used for other tasks. These rush lights burn a bit cleaner and more controlled compared to the fur candles, but they have the same problem that you always need to keep replacing them. This rush light is six centimeters long and half a centimeter wide and only burned for six minutes. So the fur candles and rush lights have the advantage that they're just so simple and they require no specialist equipment to function. But their downside is that they don't burn for very long and their burn rate is difficult to control. But this final method I'll show you uses a specialist lamp design, yet it is still elegantly simple, allowing it to be used in Scotland for centuries. I want to say a huge thanks to Sean Fraser for hand forging me this lamp, and also thanks to Donald Jeffries for allowing Sean to use your original anvil that has within it a mould allowing these lamps to be shaped. Now Sean is from the Shetland Islands, and this lamp is based off an uh, actual historical piece from Shetland, but almost identical lamps were found all over Scotland. In the Shetland Isles, these are usually referred to as Coley's, and that name probably comes from Shetland's Norse influence. But in other parts of Scotland, they're generally referred to as a Cruise or Cruishin. Now before we light it, we first need a fuel and a wick. And the most common fuel used for it was fish oil. And this was typically made by the people themselves. They would go out, catch a bunch of fish from the sea, take out the livers, cook up the fish livers in a big pot, sieve out the chunks, and there you go. You're left with a lovely, if not smelly, oil. Now you can use a few different things as a wick. Basically anything that will draw up that oil. So you could use a piece of linen, some bog cotton, even old man's beard lichen was used. But the best and easiest is once again a lovely soft rush pith. The lamp was typically made from iron and were generally forged by local blacksmiths. This example consists of three parts. A hanging hook, a undershell joined to an upright bracket which has a notched bar projecting upwards from the centre of the upright. The final piece is an upper shell, slightly smaller than the undershell and is attached to the lamp by sliding it over the notched bar. So how do we light it? Well, first make sure the upper shell is sitting on one of the far back lower notches so that it's sitting parallel with the lower shell. Then fill the upper shell with your oil and lay your wick from the center of the dish to the end of the spout. Give it a couple of minutes for the wick to soak up the oil and now it's ready to light. And this was typically done in the 17th century using a flint and steel some charred material and some dried plant fibres to blow that ember to a flame. And there you go, the soft rush wick is drawing up the oil from the centre of the dish and over time that oil level will go down and so will the flame. But this is where the notched bar comes in. As the oil gets burned you move the upper dish further up the notched bar causing the upper shell to tilt forward slightly making more oil flow towards the wick, keeping it burning. Every time the flame starts to diminish, you simply move the upper shell up a notch until your oil burns out and you start again. And this lower shell is simply there to catch any dripping oil, so not to waste it. And the wee curly bits aren't just decorative, they act like adjustment handles 
and the one on the notch bar is handy to put spare wicks and even to place a wee stick that you can use to adjust and prod the wick. Now, single dish oil lamps with this similar spout shape have been around since the Stone Age, often made from stone or clay. But with those, you need to keep on refilling and adjusting the wick, whereas this double tilting dish design makes it much more efficient time and fuel wise. And as far as I'm aware, this particular design is quite unique to this part of the world. But let me know in the comments what sort of oil lamp design comes from your country's history. So from experimenting with this so far, I found I can get between four and six hours of burn time from one dish of oil. So much better than the previous two. It's also much easier to control by just tilting the dish and by playing around with the wicks. And it's much more efficient with oil and with wicks. So you can see why this simple and elegant design was used in Scotland for so long. I want to say a huge thanks to Sean Fraser for forging me this cruisy lamp, as well as Matt from Flet Forge for forging me the fur candle holder. I really appreciate it guys. I'll put a link to both of their Instagrams in the description below. Definitely check them out. Also, thank you to Wandrium and my patrons for making this video possible. Please do try out that free trial and check out the Patreon page if you're interested in the free content. Thanks so much for watching folks and I'll see you next month in another video.